we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks everyone so much for being here. Welcome to our Transhuman Panel Festo. I'm Jacob Boss, doctoral candidate at Indiana University, and we collectively are all members of the Human Augmentation Research Network, or HARN, conceived in 2019 as a supportive research organization for grad students and early career scholars exploring the intersections of religion and technology. We share an interest in changing the grounds on which conversations about human augmentation have taken place. And this panel festo is a way for us to come together to begin weaving our vision for a published manifesto. Each member will introduce themselves and speak for about 15 minutes. We'll take questions after for the remaining time. I wanna thank you all again so much for being here. Our first presenter today is Jeremy Cohen. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jeremy Cohen. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Religious Studies at McMaster University in uh, Hamilton, Ontario. And uh, yeah, I'm beyond grateful to be here as part of this panel festo and alongside friends old and new. So ideologies of immortality and death positivity are aesthetics at the boundary of the acceptable. They are both responses to contemporary culture, which come about or which come out of particular historical circumstances while staking political claims about what it means to live a good life and in some cases die a good death. So my presentation today, I explore the intersections of transhumanism and death acceptance using medical aid in dying in cryonics as case studies to challenge the notion that death, pos uh, death positivity and transhumanism are necessarily separate magisteria. For those of you who may not know, cryonics is a movement that is philosophically connected to transhumanism that broadly speaking seeks to preserve corpses in vats of liquid nitrogen with the goal of eventually bringing them back to life. Not every transhumanist wants to utilize cryogenics and not every cryonicist self-identifies as a transhumanist but the overlap between the movements are significant. My presentation is inspired by my research with transhumanists, immortalists, and cryogenesis, as well as my participation in the death positive movement. Living in the margins of these two social movements and exploring the boundaries of death acceptance and immortality has opened new avenues for my ethnographic research and complicates many scholarly and popular accounts of a monolithic transhumanist worldview and ethos. The death positive movement is a small but vocal grassroots movement. Oh, sorry, I realize that this is being hidden. There we go. Um, so yes, it's a small but vocal grassroots movement in the West that has emerged over the last two decades. The movement is a loosely affiliated community of bloggers, death doulas, made medical aid and uh, dying advocates, death care professionals, entrepreneurs, and others. Some of the aims of the movement are to normalize conversations around death and dying, support alternative disposition methods like green burial, human composting, uh, and biocremation, critique our overly medicalized ways of dying, and shift responsibility for the dead away from the hands of professionals. Importantly, access to a good death, a death that is anticipated and on one's own terms, is a coalescing ideal for advocates. I'll get to this shortly, but this is also a community that I am uh, deeply involved in. The death positive movement, who transhumanists pejoratively refer to as deathists, are generally skeptical of transhumanism and technologies of immortality like cryonics. The comments on a cryonics episode of the YouTube series Ask a Mortician, run by celebrity deathist Caitlin Doughty, are largely representative of the death positive position on transhumanism, describing it as a death-denying movement meant for sci-fi nerds and those who are out of touch with reality. In the comments of a YouTube video, one user wrote in response to a cryonic supporter, quote, when you die, you're not figuring out anything. Brain activity stops. You are simply a dumbass in death denial. You will simply be a frozen dead dumbass. For death positive activists, transhumanist technologies like cryonics are spaces of privilege for white upper class males and are incongruent with the larger aims of the death positive movement, which advocates for the acceptance of death as an inevitable and natural event. 
I should note that the death positive movement is itself largely made up of white middle to upper class North Americans, and it is also gendered, although opposite uh, transhumanism, it is mostly made up of women. For its part, transhumanists tend to view the death positive movement with equal derision. When I've spoken to life extensionists about the death positive movement, most respond with bewilderment that anyone would be, quote, in support of death. One commentator on an online anti-deathist FAQ writes, quote, Deathism is getting really old. Women like Caitlin Dowdy are promoting death and gaining followers. It's sad that she's more popular than Aubrey de Grey and other anti-aging researchers. In a blog post criticizing an upcoming death positive conference, a transhumanist blogger wrote, quote, Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, I realize I mixed up my slides here. Uh, so this transhumanist blogger wrote, quote, Every time I've seen someone say they're death positive, they've let slip that they're against life extension and actively want to die. These people actually want to die. But worse, they want you to die and me to die, and they will pull out every excuse in the book to justify why that is a good and natural thing. I bring these examples of boundary work into this presentation to highlight the epistemological divide between many deathists and the larger transhumanist and cryogenics movement. While this divide may seem obvious at first glance, the antagonistic discourse that occurs between both camps hides the possibility of shared goals and objectives, as paradoxical as this may seem, and it also reifies a normative approach to both movements. So medical aid in dying, or MAID, is the process of hastening death to alleviate an individual's suffering. Individuals given a terminal prognosis where assisted dying is legal have the option to medically end their lives when suffering becomes unbearable. While MAID is seemingly antithetical to the aims of transhumanism, this is not necessarily the case with cryogenics. During my field work uh, in Scottsdale, I was introduced to the story of Thomas Donaldson and his fight for access to MAID. Um, he was fighting for access to it in California in the 1990s. Donaldson was a cryonicist, um, a member of Alcor Cryonics in Scottsdale, and after receiving a terminal prognosis, he became an activist for the right to die. Donaldson fought for the right to legally end his own life at the moment of his choosing because of the tumor that was slowly destroying his brain. If Donaldson had to wait until he died naturally to be cryopreserved, the chances of his successful future reanimation would be greatly diminished. For cryonicists, this is an example of a bad death, and a bad death is ultimately what Donaldson experienced. Uh, and I should note the first person to actually utilize medical aid in dying in order to be cryopreserved was a gentleman named Norman Hardy in 2016, um, who used that, uh, the newly enacted law in California and then was flown to Alcor. The ideal good death, as advocated for many in the cryonics movement, is to allow people to utilize assisted dying within a cryonics facility and this is a process that's referred to as cryothanasia. And while cryothanasia is not legal anywhere yet, cryonicists have, for decades, been at the forefront of the movement to legalize medical aid and dying. In any case, an issue for deathists is not the technology of cryonics itself. Rather, it is the assumption that those who utilize cryonics, or wish to utilize it, or are in support of the larger aims of the transhumanist movement, are in denial of their mortality, and that this denial is inherently psychologically unhealthy and a symptom of larger societal issues. The charge of death denial assumes that Cryonix members do not have a positive relationship with mortality, which in turn assumes that those who utilize MAID or are part of an activist community in support of it directly engage with death in healthier ways. Uh, the reality that I have found is that this is a bit more complicated. Transhumanists, would likely argue that there are no good deaths, which critics point to as an example of unhealthy death denial. Yet I have found that it is not lost to many cryonicists and transhumanists that death is a given, and how one dies, so long as death remains our ultimate horizon, remains important. Even at RADFEST, one of the largest life extension conferences, where death is called out as the ultimate enemy by presenters on stage, Engagements with mortality, in a positive sense, are visible. 
For example, at RadFest in 2018, invited speaker Natasha Vita Moore, one of the earliest proponents of transhumanism as a worldview and philosophy, took to the stage to argue in defense of pragmatic death acceptance and stated that rather than turning a blind eye to the inevitability of death in today's world, facing it head on is at issue. Vita Moore told the crowd in a passionate and firm tone, quote, I know death is not something we want to refer to, but we must. I know what it is like to be a caretaker. People are dying and we need to have compassion. Go to hospice and spread compassion. People who want to die, have compassion for them. Returning to cryonics, supporters, many of whom participate in the larger life extension community, argue that rather than augment a fear of death, cryonics demands a direct confrontation with mortality. Dennis Kowalski, the founder, of, uh, the founder and president of Cryonics Institute in Michigan, writes on their website, quote, having a death plan or simply telling people what you want to happen to your body will ultimately allow you to live a more comfortable, death positive life instead of denying an inevitable reality, even if that means trying to cheat death ultimately with cryonics. When I asked John, an Alcor member in his 60s, about his fear of dying, he counseled me to read Atul Gawande's Being Mortal if I wanted to learn how I can accept death. And I have been counseled by many death positive activists to read the same book. Whether it is a cryonicist advocating for the right to die, a transhumanist figurehead telling conference attendees to volunteer at hospice, or the names of the dead whispered in secret as affirmations of their essence, death has been an ever-present reality among those who wish to not die. While fear of death may speak to individual motivations, and certainly does for many of my research subjects, I have found engagements with mortality among cryonicists and transhumanists in very unexpected ways. In the pseudo-epigraphic Testament of Abraham, God sends the angel Michael to go down to my friend Abraham and speak to him concerning death so that he may put his affairs in order. However, Michael succumbs to Abraham's hospitality come trickery and returns to God without the patriarch in tow. After Abraham continues to refuse God's demand that he accept his mortality, death tricks Abraham and eventually is able to bring him to God. The inevitability of Abraham's death is not lost on Isaac who earlier had a dream in which God takes from him the sun and the moon, but leaves him with the rays. Yet, what are the rays without the sun to direct them or the moon to reflect them? For some, memories of the dead and platitudes about death belonging to some natural order cannot reduce the chasm left by absence. And in this way, I emphasize, uh, empathize sorry, with those who seek to circumvent death and the, dying, the painful dying process. While we may feel connections to the communities and cultures we study, as Clifford Geertz observed, you don't exactly penetrate another culture. You put yourself in its way and it bodies forth and enmeshes you. I approach the subject of immortality from a less than dispassionate place, even as I remain an outsider to the communities described in my research. I am an active participant in society's cult of death. I run a very popular website dedicated to discussions around death and dying. My wife is the founder and president of an online memorialization company, and this means that we are both uh, professionally and personally connected to a large network of death professionals. I, I also teach courses on death and dying. Um, I spend too much time visiting cemeteries, and I participate in death positive events. But even as a participant in the death positive community, where I advocate publicly for death acceptance, I find myself very uncomfortable with the thought of death. There's so much mystery in the world, and the idea that experience is limited to our short lifespan brings me very little comfort. There are moments, usually occurring while camping next to a lake in remote wilderness, that I find the possibility of immortality to be very appealing. Knowing that Alzheimer's is present in my family history is another reason that I'm not entirely optimistic about my aged future. Like Abraham, who is literally faced with death in the figure of the angel Michael, yet who refuses to go gently into that good night, if you'll excuse my mixed literary references, I have come out of my research project with a self-understanding as a death-positive transhumanist. While I do not identify as a transhumanist or an immortalist, as I am far from convinced of the utopia promised by mainline transhumanism, I maintain hope in the positive possibilities of a techno-future 
and welcome any attempt at alleviating human and non-human suffering. At the same time, I maintain that it is important and necessary to have open and honest conversations around death and dying, so long as death remains what greets us at the end. This position has led me to many productive and interesting conversations in both the death positive community and the radical life extension community, um, where I have found myself to be both an interlocutor and a researcher. And so, to con actually conclude, this is a declaration at the margins, a testament to the positive possibilities that come with sitting on the fence or having a foot planted on either side of a threshold. This is a declaration about the comfort of blurred boundaries and the complexity of being human. This is a proclamation that one can hold the ideals of death positivity and transhumanism as one without fearing accusations of transgression and without the fear of transgressing or perhaps finding comfort in transgression and what opening ourselves up to the different kinds of positionality or to different kinds of positionality can accomplish. But this is also a declaration of the need for a human-centered, ethnographically informed approach to transhumanisms and various forms of human augmentation. We might be surprised at what we find at the boundaries. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeremy. All right, I'm going to see about getting Sade set up now. So let's see. Um, okay, shall I press share screen? Yeah, can you try sharing screen? Oh, I can't start screen share while other participant is sharing. Okay. So I stopped Jeremy sharing, and now can you try again? Okay. All right, we can see your screen. And let's test your audio. All right, am I audible right now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And then I will go into slideshow mode. Yeah, is that what Jeremy used? Yes. Okay. And then if you want to just introduce yourself briefly. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, and I, thanks, Jacob. Um, I, I have a view right now, camera-wise, as though I'm sitting in the audience. And so I'm seeing <laughs> Jacob, Jeremy, and Alicia. And, um, but if you're in the audience, imagine that I'm looking at and saying hello to you um, and introducing myself to you. I'm Dr. Sharday Mazranjan. I'm an associate professor in the School of Religion at Queen's University in Kingston. Ontario, and um, I am feeling really grateful right now to uh, realize that after hearing what Jeremy just shared, that this opportunity that we as Harn have made for ourselves to work together continuously over the years is meaning that I get to see different connections between our work based on where my mindset is at a different time. And recently I've been grappling with a lot of the kinds of issues that Jeremy was just getting at. And it just made me think that what I'm about to share with you is in large part my, my interest in psychedelics is it flows from my interest in meaning um, and the problem of meaninglessness, which as a personal experience that I dealt with through boredom in my first book. And then now with my work on psychedelics, it's a part of that has really been driven by the kinds of claims that people have made about overcoming death in some kind of way, um, some sort of intuition about um, that, that there continues to be a meaningful uh, way of participating in reality after death. So, um, so I'm going to share a bit about 
uh, my thinking as I embark on this new project on psychedelics, and I'll do that by way of a story. So I got um, I got a message from a colleague and friend last week with a link and the comment that I might find something of interest in this brief and albeit sometimes breezy piece from Unheard. Its title isn't accurate, but there are good bits, and I thought of your work when the writer discussed the lack of religious vocabulary and knowledge surrounding psychedelic enthusiasms on both the scientific and popular sides. So if you click the link to the opinion piece, the title comes up as, and this is the image that comes up with it, the title comes up as, is the psychedelic industrial complex evil? But if you paste the link, it generates the title, the psychedelic industrial complex is evil, answering its own question. I told my friend and colleague, who's actually from University Research Services here at Queens, that it was perfect timing for me to receive this from him because I was writing this presentation to share at this panel where I'm thinking about psychedelics in terms of human augmentation technologies, biohacking, transhumanism, etc. And I think this article basically stands for the position that I'm suggesting we can think more accurately and hopefully from the perspective of religious studies of transhumanism. Here's the major claim that the writer makes about psychedelics vis-a-vis -vis religion and human augmentation. This is a fellow called Ed Prudeau. So Ed says, psychedelic trips have played a part in mystical traditions for millennia, but the revival comes at a time when our old religions are endangered. The march of reason and evidence has left a gaping void. Absurdly utopian rhetoric abounds among the proponents of psychedelics who include many powerful people in the tech world. Certain transhumanist thinkers in Silicon Valley have called for more research into drugs that produce permanent bliss states without side effects. Theirs is an abolitionist technology or ideology that seeks to eliminate all conscious suffering from the universe. Meanwhile, Elon Musk, who hints strongly at a taste for psychedelics like DMT, has expressed hopes of extending the light of consciousness to the stars in tandem with technology. This language goes beyond aspiration or even idealism. It's a simulated religion. Inconveniently, there are dangers in viewing our search for God as a technical problem, one that can be solved through human ingenuity. I want to say the same two things back to this writer that I've said to the proponents of psychedelic that he judges negatively when they fearfully point to a void of old religions, but hopefully point towards psychedelics as a means to fulfill it. One, the void is an illusion. You're not seeing a void, what you're seeing is change. And for this audience, I'm of course referring basically to the weak secularization thesis as religious change rather than disappearance. And two, the form of religion that you think psychedelics either fails to manifest or needs to manifest in order to fill the void is also an illusion. It's a misunderstanding of history to suppose that technical thinking is antithetical to the old religions. And it's a misunderstanding of the present to suppose that what we're doing as we gather together to have and discuss non-ordinary experiences with psychedelics isn't already religion just because it doesn't follow the church type model that defines religion implicitly in your imagination. I can give you a sense from my fieldwork of what the latter looks like among the people for whom psychedelics do offer utopian possibilities. I was giving a talk about my research at a psychedelic town hall in my city recently um, this is me and my friend Corey Firth, who works with the NUMA Center here in Kingston, which is like a psychedelic resource center. And in the question period, somebody raised their hand and asked me something like, church attendance is down, the churches are closing their doors, and that kind of community is so important for people to have a sense of meaning. What's going to replace them? Can psychedelics fit there? Does psychedelics offer us anything there? Are we going to see the rise of 
more psychedelic churches. And I, in answer, gestured around myself to the room of people who had gathered at the grad club on campus to hear my talk on psychedelics and then do a sound bath ceremony together um, with uh, our friend Shannon Brown, who's pictured here with her sound bath tools. And then to hang out and mingle and meet new people. And I said, we're doing it right now. I said, I'm not saying we should call this a church or call this our religion, but I'm saying that it's not failing to fulfill those human needs for community and meaning just because we're not. We can find this problem that you've identified is a lot closer to a solution if we take the description lightly, church versus psychedelic town hall, and take the function seriously. We've gathered here to do some metaphysical thinking, to have a non-ordinary sensory experience, and then to hang out. I felt some pleasure and relief when um, the question asker seemed willing to take up the invitation I offered to see things this way. And my relief was because I have felt discouraged when I hear the naysayers, like that Ed Prudeau fellow, shut down psychedelics as an avenue of psychological and social and existential hope. For the first time in my career, I sense that in doing psychedelic research, I'm contributing to a community that I can be a part of. And when I hear voices that are not only cautionary and critical, but judgmental and dismissive of the eudaimonic goals of that community, I fear that I will lose that experience of meaningfully contributing with my work and personally belonging to a community. It would be a hollow and temporary win for me, though, if it turns out that I'm defending the hopeful possibilities of psychedelics in order to meet my need for meaningful work and community when psychedelics actually offer no such benefits to anyone. But as I said, I see a genuine misunderstanding about religion vis-a-vis -vis psychedelics that, if corrected, makes it easy to see that the worried ones and the hopeful ones are both on the same side of something in a way that doesn't necessitate the busting up of this community. I think the difference between the two affective approaches, the worried and the hopeful, is not that the worried envision a utopia of pain and don't want a utopia of bliss. And in my experience, it's usually not even that they're anti-psychedelic. The difference is in their assessment of how psychedelics can or can't meet the conditions that result in bliss or at least a reduction of suffering. The worried imagine that psychedelics can't meet the need for existential hope or community that they see offered in the old religions or the church forms of the old religions. And the hopeful, on the other hand, imagine that psychedelics can meet the need for existential hope or community that they see offered in the old religions or the church forms of the world religions. But I think both positions misunderstand the religious landscape by assuming that only the old religions, as we see so often pictured in versions of this image um, being what people are thinking about when they think about religion. Um, I think the mistake is assuming that only those old religions contain the ingredients for human and hopefully more than human flourishing. These misunderstandings that I see from both optimistic and pessimistic commentators on the so-called psychedelic renaissance are why I want to be part of the psychedelic conversation as a religion scholar studying human augmentation. I see that a basic religious studies education can clear away some unnecessary worries and that religion scholars can then contribute to the work of coming up with better formed problems. One of the better formed problems that I've come up with so far is to account for the way that people use psychedelics, not yet, as a psychotechnology, how they ritualize these practices, form communities around them, and develop metaphysical positions in accord with them and to install my account in the religious studies research literature on transhumanism. Psychedelics have been fairly little studied by religion scholars and by the humanities and social sciences broadly compared to their study by psychology and neuroscience. A certain kind of conspiracy theology has sometimes spoken over or for the quiet or silent voice of religious studies on psychedelic matters. Archaeologists John Allegro's The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, 
the classicist Carl Ruck's chapter in The Road to Eleusis, and the lawyer Brian Murarescu's revival of Ruck in The Immortality Key have all argued for the all but total indissolubility of psychedelics and mythological religious systems dating back to the Eleusinian mysteries, and contended that they, the mainstream academy, big research, don't want you to know about it. My friend who is a biblical historian laughs when I mention this mole that keeps popping up and then getting whacked down and popping up again and says, what? We love this shit. The weirder the pharmaca, the better for us. And as far as I can tell, the silence has not been on account of muzzling discoveries of evidence that would profane the image of Christianity held sacred by biblical historians, but rather their wordless shoulder shrug at evidence about things that they don't particularly care about. The psychedelic hypothesis about the origins of Christianity and religion in general is simply gilding the lily. Serious students of Greco-Roman antiquity already recognize a large menu of entheogenic strategies. You can fast for a long time, you can meditate for a long time, you can dance for a long time, you can pray with your head between your knees for a long time. There are lots of ways to occasion visionary experiences other than taking on board a molecule that agonizes the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor system, which is the feature that defines the classic psychedelics as a class. And as for the contemporary period, at least over the past half century or so, there's plenty of evidence that psychedelics have been part of the religious landscape, but not very centrally in the church type religion that the world religions paradigm has cared about. Rather, psychedelics have been a vital and vibrant dimension of popular Western spirituality. At places such as Esalen, pictured here. Here, religious studies uptake has been marginal because universities have made countless hires in Paul studies compared to every hire in, say, new religious movements. With the Paul folks defining what's worth talking about in books, courses, and conference, religious studies has inherited a prejudice that drug experiences are not important parts of the religious landscape today. Now, as the historian of Western esotericism, Bader Hanukkah, has recently argued, it's time that religious studies scholars begin taking psychedelic experiences of gnosis, mysticism, or contact with occult beings seriously. With the perspective of the newer fields of Western esotericism, new religious movements, and transhumanism, it's possible to explain silence around psychedelics as the result of something other than a conspiracy of Christian purists to suppress a trove of revolutionary evidence. That is, it's possible to contextualize scholarly disinterest in psychedelics as part of a larger project of separating good versus bad versions of non-ordinary experience in culture generally, which takes place through practices of separating out psychedelic visionary experiences from real religion, on the one hand, and practices of separating out psychedelic mind-brain augmentation from proper uses of science and technology on the other. My fieldwork thus explores how concepts like mystical experience and spirituality are incorporated into scientists' models of psychedelic brain states, in clinicians' models of psychedelic healing and wellness, and psychonauts' models of psychedelics' meaning in cultural and personal life. Here's an example of Roland Griffiths, who I think fits all three of those categories, and is always talking about spirituality and psychedelics, but without referring to the Rell's literature. A constructive task that this approach of mine can do is show both the worried ones and the hopeful ones how to look at the psychedelic landscape and see form rather than a religious void. The second thing that this disciplinary positionality can do is expand the way that religious studies approaches transhumanism by expanding its exploration of morphological freedom with an exploration of human augmentation of consciousness or the pursuit of cognitive liberty. Right now, the stakeholders of the so-called psychedelic renaissance are debating whether one's right to change their consciousness should depend on the medicalization of psychedelics, that is, being sick enough and in the right way to need psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy, or whether access to psychedelics should be assured by the fundamental freedom of the individual, which is the cognitive liberty argument, a la Karl Hart in his Drug Use for Grown-Ups. And that's certainly the social position that I take, 
for cognitive liberty and um, drug use for grown-ups. It remains for me to articulate the many specific substances and ritual techniques that psychonauts and clinicians and researchers are using to meet their needs for cognitive growth through psychedelics and the many different ways that they explain these needs in terms of specific concerns like healing from depression or connecting to source consciousness. But for today, I will stop at having articulated the dual meaning of my title. My invitation is one, to consider both socially and disciplinarily that the freedom to change the body includes the freedom to change the mind brain. And two, to pursue the ethnographic, historical and philosophical work of accounting for the ways that people use psychedelics to make such changes, how they ritualize these practices, form communities around them and develop metaphysical positions in accord with them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sade. Alicia, you're up next. Let me just go ahead and adjust the zoom. Can everyone hear me okay? How's the audio out there? Louder? Perfect, thank you. Um, before I start, I just want to say thank you to the members of HARN. For, I'm the newest member, and it's really nice as a junior academic to have a group of people that I can talk to about anything from my research to navigating the path of grad school. So thank you guys very much, Sharday. I know you couldn't be here today, but it was really nice to hear you speak. So, uh, my presentation is called Reframing Transhumanism, and I will be talking about some new explorations in the study of the Jewish critique of transhumanism. Very few scholars have paid attention to the growing academic field of transhumanism. In spite of the number of scholars working in thriving fields like Jewish bioethics, almost none have researched or written about either Jewish transhumanism or the way Jewish thought and ethics might approach transhumanism. The notable exception to this lack of interest is Chava Trosh Samuelson, a philosopher by training, um, who's here today. I was particularly fond of her breakdown of transhumanism's different flavors, founders, prophets, and thought projects. I am thrilled that she has started asking these questions about transhumanism and started the scholarly conversation on transhumanism for other academics to discuss further. Yet to have a healthy conversation, we need multiple pr perspectives. Today I'm going to offer my own scholarly view, which I will frame largely as a conversation in response to her work. While we share some of the same questions, my own interpretation on the intersections between Judaism and transhumanism depart from hers. For example, her 2021 presentation, Transhumanism as Contemporary Idolatry, a Judaic Critique, concluded that she con considers transhumanist projects to be techno-idolatry. She furthered this notion in her 2022 interview with Ted Peters, Religious Transhumanism 6, Jewish? No. Where she stated, transhumanism venerates human-made inventions and people who create them. Now they, transhumanists, idolize technology. Transhumanism does not simply use technology, technological innovations to improve the human condition. Rather, it considers technology itself to be a force of salvation. I do not agree with this notion of transhumanist techno-idolatry. 
At the very least, it is only one possible voice from Jewish tradition. Furthermore, I feel that she has ignored uh, grassroots transhumanists, um, has no engagement with Jewish apocalypticism or anticipatory messianism, and her accusations of techno-idolatry can be directly linked to the biblical death penalty. I find this unwarranted given that their, tr their work has the potential to save many lives. In this presentation, I, accept, I attempt to demonstrate this by returning to the biblical injunctions against idolatry and Maimonides' Mishnah Torah. Furthermore, drawing on new ethnographic studies of transhumanism, including those of my colleagues here with us today, I will show that these transhumanists are not worshipping technology, but attempting to use technology to further humanity, ameliorating sick, ailing, and ignored bodies and minds in different, but not idolatrous ways. In transhumanism as a contemporary in transhumanism as a don't, oh, excuse me, as contemporary idolatry, a Judaic, Judaic critique, uh, Dr. Tarosh Samuelson t cited two Torah sources that prohibit idolatry, Exodus 20.35 and Isaiah 42.8. Exodus 23-5 is the second of the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai and stated in part, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee a graven image, nor any manner of likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that it is in earth below, or that it is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down unto them, nor shalt serve them, for I, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. The second prohibition, Isaiah 42, 8, was, I am the Lord that is my name, and my glory will not give to another, neither my praise to graven image, images. Diving into Encyclopedia Judaica's expansive article on idolatry for further explanation, the biblical injunction against idolatry comprises three more or less separate matters, the worshiping of idols, the worshiping of God with pagan rites, and the making of idols. Worship of idols was broken down further into four subpoints, which clearly delineate the constitution of idol worship. Idol worship and pagan rituals, bowing to idols, the offering of sacrifices, human or not, to other gods, and the giving of reverence to an idol. Based on these primary prohibitions on idolatry and their explanations, I remain unclear about the connection Dr. Trosh Samuelson sees between them and transhumanism. She posited her commentary in the presentation, Transhumanism as Contemporary Idolatry. She argued that there is common ground between Judaism and transhumanism and gave five points of correlation. One, the human being is regarded as a partner of God in the betterment of the world. Two, a pro-biotechnology stance, especially in regard to assisted reproductive technologies. Three, a utopian impulse and concern for the alleviation of human suffering. Four, a pro-human stance. And five, the concern about playing God does not play an important role in Judaic reflections on technology. Based on these points, she might have thought positively about Jewish transhumanism, but some of her other thoughts clear cleared up her calcification against it, which I will go through point by point. I do not find that these critiques are well supported by the data of transhumanism. The first point, skepticism about futuristic speculations, they tell us more about the present than the future, reminds us simply what science fiction has always told us, more about current times than the future. But transhumanist projects are no longer years in the future. They are, as Beth Singer, Singer argues in Blessed by the Algorithm, happening now. Second, the rejection of transhumanism, mind, body, dualism, and identification with the self, uh, of the self with computational reality, which might be the strongest critique. The, transhumanism, the transhumanist Cartesian mind-body dualism might end up being reductive in its attempt to download the human mind, as well as the self via computational reality. While not necessarily Cartesian, Ju Judaism holds plenty of body-soul dualities that are perceivably similar. Third, the unease about apocalyptic eschatology and the endorsement of anticipatory consciousness, which seems odd given that Judaism has already been uneasy about apocalyptic eschatology for millennia. It's my belief that this unease comes from the techno-futurist ideas that accompany transhumanist eschatological beliefs. Furthermore, I question how the endorsement... Whoops, excuse me. I, I wonder how the endorsement... Sorry, I lost my spot. The endorsement of the anticipatory consciousness lines up with any critique of transhumanism given the Jewish messianic anticipation. 
Fourth, the rejection of technological fetishism as a form of idolatry, which ignores the, the work of grassroots transhumanists, commonly, commonly known as grinders. These grinders are conduct, conducting scientific and medical experiments on themselves due to a failure of medical and academic institutions. In my opinion, these experiments qualify as pikoach nefesh, the Jewish law that trumps all others on account of saving a life. Finally, the professed concern about the negative impacts of transhumanist futurism on our society and culture, as if the current prospect or other futuristic ideologies would be better. In Transhumanism as Techno-Idolatry, she also employed an interesting set of quotes to support her arguments. These quotes were from Halbertal and Margalit's Idolatry. They were, quote, the biblical prohibition against idolatry entails not only a ban on the worship of other gods, but also a ban on certain ways of representing the right god, end quote, and, quote, idol worship is a form of fetish, fetish, fetishization in which the worshiper mistakenly substitutes some object for god. Substitution is sinful because of the worshiper. The image is not a sign or symbol of god, it is god. Um, these claims were only correct when directed against elite transhumanists, those who AI ethicist Timnit Gebru calls AI cultists, who are worshipping technology, aiming to create a god as the superintelligent AI, or hoping that humanity will merge itself into some kind of god universe consciousness. Next, she pointed to creation in the image of God, Maimonides' radical transcendence. According to Genesis 127, um, which quotes, and God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, which is commonly referred to as creation in the image of God, or in Hebrew, B'Tselem Elohim. Um, this continues to be, this was and continues to be one of the strongest arguments against the transhumanist radical alteration to the human. However, Maimonides was clear about what the image of God was in his monumental legal code, Mishnah Torah, and it did not have to do with the body. He said, end quote, Behold, it is explicitly stated in the Torah and the prophets that the Holy One, blessed be he, is not confined to a body or a physical form, as Deuteronomy 4.39 and Joshua 2.11 states, Because God, your Lord, is the Lord in the heavens above and the earth below, and a body cannot exist in two places simultaneously. Also, Deuteronomy 4.15 states, For you did not see any images, and Isaiah 40.25 states, To whom can you liken me, with whom with whom I will be equal. Where he, God, was confined to a body, he would resemble other bodies. He has no image or form. Images of God are merely expressions of prophetic visions and imagery, and the truth of this concept cannot be grasped or comprehended by human thoughts. Roughly 700 years after Maimonides, Rabbi Avraham Yitzchak HaKohen Cook, the first Ashkenazi chief rabbi of British Mandatory Palestine, expounded on Maimonides' idea of the image of God. He explained, the main character of image, the image, is the complete freedom that we, may fi that we find in man by virtue of which he possesses free will. And if there is no free will, there will be no place for the Torah. If so, then free will is the basis of the Torah from a practical standpoint, perspective. Thus, when looking at transhumanist projects that aim to change the human, based on Maimonides and Rav Cook, there's no issue with altering the human form in order to better it. The image of God is the free will to make choices. Lastly, Dr. Troj Samuelson quoted Julio Prisco's Transcending Engin Transcendent Engineering. There, Prisco stated, the ultimate realization of the dream to achieve indefinite lifespan with vastly enhanced cognitive abilities lies in leaving behind and moving to a new post-biological cybernetic phase of our evolution. Someday we may create God, and if we create God, then we are God. While this sentiment may be correct when again aimed at elite transhumanists, this was cited despite Prisco concluding that ultimately, the promises of apocalyptic AI are almost identical to those of Jewish and Christian apocalyptic traditions, which directly con contradicted the critique from the previous slide. Based on this, making a new god and worshipping it really only concerns elite fanaticists and doesn't speak to the work of grassroots transhumanists. Jacob's ex extensive eth ethnography of grassroots transhumanism includes, included much research on the aforementioned grinders, grassroots transhumanists who conduct scientific and medical experimentation on themselves in hopes of helping themselves or others who have been failed by medical or academic institutions. Jacob defined grinders in his recent article, Punk, Punks and Profiteers in the War on Death. Quote, the grinders are a movement of grassroots technology enthusiasts, grungy and poorly funded do-it-yourself inventors and artists, 
punk and cyberpunk influenced visionaries. Fundamentally, grinders are modest. Grinding pioneer Left Anonym um, stated that immortality isn't the goal of grinding, but serving others, helping people, exploring, and artistic creation is. Again, I think it necessary to mention the near groundbreaking work that Dr. Tarosh Samuelson has published. In opening this conversation, she has allowed many new scholarly exchanges about the broad range of to transhumanist topics. Yet I would like to offer one more word of caution as we embark in the study of transhumanism from Jewish texts and traditions. This public critique of grassroots transhumanists invoked the capital punishment that follows idol worship as mentioned in the Torah. By making the claim that transhumanists have been worshiping idols, this condemned them in biblical terms to death. At least in three places in the Torah, Exodus 22:19, Deuteronomy 17, 2-7, and Leviticus 21-5, all explicitly state that anyone who created idols for themselves or others, who worshipped idols or sacrificed them, should be put to death. Given my claim of pikuach nefesh, these grinders should be praised for their life-saving technologies and hacks, not condemned in any way. While no one has been put to death by a Jewish religious court in many years, the precedent still stands. Labeling transhumanists as idol worshippers carries grave consequences in the religious world. As Jewish philosophers and thinkers, we should be wary of the halachic paradigms we are employing in the secular and academic world, especially when it comes to potentially life-saving experimentation and technology. Thank you. Thanks so much, Alicia. Thank you so much, everyone who's been here for our panel. Thank you so much to our panelists. My talk is our concluding talk for today. And I'm Jacob Boss. I'm a doctoral candidate at Indiana University. And we need a new history of transhumanism. We need a new history, one that includes the grassroots of the movement, where transhumanism is developing in anti-oppressive and anti-authoritarian directions. The most widely circulated history of transhumanism today is Nick Bostrom's from 2005. And um, I'm sorry uh, you're seeing these faces a lot this week. In this wax museum of eugenicists, Bostrom is the one on the left. And drawing a line that stretches from Gilgamesh's search for immortality to his work on overcoming existential risk. Bostrom's history brings the reader to the doorstep of long-termism, what Mary Jane Rubinstein called yesterday a murderous numerology. Long-termism is the idea that trying to guarantee the existence of unfathomable numbers of future humans who don't exist yet is ethically superior to putting resources toward taking care of the humans that already exist today. In his history of transhumanism, Bostrom places the grassroots at the level of his own network of think tanks, journals, and organizations, as well as the US cryonics movement with its expensive subscription plans to preserve frozen bodies awaiting resurrection, and transhumanist political and intellectual organizations such as the World Transhumanist Association or Humanity Plus. Now this disturbing image comes from Emil Torres's reporting on Bostrom. Bostrom has been taking some heat lately since the surfacing of a racist and hateful email that he wrote about the inferiority of black intelligence. The anti-black animus in Bostrom's writing was no surprise to scholars like Timnit Gebru, who Elisha mentioned, who have been warning us about the dangers of Bostrom-affiliated philosophies like long-termism and effective altruism. 
given the record to given the opportunity to set the record straight, Bostrom, who has long worried about dysgenic pressure, the idea that the wrong kind of people will outbreed the right kind of people, delivered what Emily Bender described as a study in non-apology, stubbornly keeping his foot wedged in the door to scientific racism. We need a new history of transhumanism because the popular history is generated from racist, eugenicist, corporatist sources should be replaced by histories that do not naturalize them. We need a critical, reflective history that will identify these problematic developmental trajectories within transhumanism and a history that is inclusive of the community level of mutual aid networks disability innovation, localized medicine, anti-racism, extra-institutional research. Gillian Weisse, disabled poet and scholar, author of Cyborg Detective, argues that the category of the cyborg is for disabled people. Weisse has another name for those who try to cultivate mystique around human-machine interfaces. Triborgs. The Triborg loves their smartwatch, their VR glasses. They seem very unconcerned that Vice's prosthetic leg, which costs $50,000, doesn't come in a woman's version. Can't take a high heel. Can't support her if she gains weight. Can't be used if she becomes pregnant. As Damian Williams has shown, cybernetics has always been about disability. The efforts of eugenicists to eliminate disability, combined with their exclusion of the grassroots, is also an attempt to eliminate the past and the present of transhumanism. To begin building a new history of transhumanism, on Friday I talked about the etymological origins of transhumanism in Dante, in the uh, 14th century Divine Comedy. And with my talk today, I want to pick up on the filaments that I laid then suggesting a connection to today's punk biohacker scene that runs back to Dante's dramatic image of transhumanizing. The change in the light of Apollo, of heaven, being akin to the flaying of the satyr Marcius and the transformation of the merman god Glaucus. Contemporary transhumanists trace their origins back to Dante to legitimize their quest for transcendence or further back to Gilgamesh to naturalize their attempts to defeat death. On Friday, I offered a different developmental trajectory for transhumanism, one that reached to and through Dante to provide a vision, quote, wet with blood and brine that embraces meaty bodies, creative risk, sensual, earthly transformation, adventure, that turns toward the richness of the world instead of away from it toward a sterile cosmic destiny. My colleagues on this panel each deepen our understanding of what's going on right now, what's going on right now just out of view. And like many of them, my work is ethnographic. I travel around the United States, crashing conventions and laboratories, conferences and research facilities. I got into this research trying to learn more about those people who wanted to live forever. But what I found was pyramid schemes, vitamin salespeople, a lot of hope with big price tags attached. And then, and then, at a queer, furry dance party in Las Vegas, I stumbled into the world of biohackers, medical anarchists, punk transhumanists, my focus switched to that network of extra institutional researchers called grinders. Loosely affiliated, grungy, poor, trans, queer, disabled hackers. Their use of biological and material sciences fascinated me and the grinder progenitor is left anonym. Pictured here. Genderless, disabled, utterly profane, but apologetic about filling my recorder with F-bombs. Left set a firm anti-exploitation tone for the movement since its inception in the late 2000s. They welcomed me in, let me witness their body modification and art, their community rituals, 
They taught me how to fight with electric knives and compete for the crown of flowers. In backyard laboratories and in urban community centers, I learned alongside these communities fighting to cobble together the resources they needed to survive and to fulfill their creative, spiritual, and emotional needs. They're out there in many different forms. At the Please Try This at Home Anarchist Unconference in 2019, with no budget, the community put on the best biohacker, not just the best biohacker event I've ever been to, but the best conference I've ever been to anywhere. There was an access coordinator, a conflict resolution manager on call, food provided by an anarchist collective, a space provided by a queer community center, there was a low stimulus room for sensory recovery, and there was a space for black and indigenous participants run by a local radical therapeutic artist group called Black Dream Escape. The conversations at the conference centered on biohacking, grinding, transhumanism, cybernetics. All of this needs a place in a new history of transhumanism. And like I said on Friday, it's important that Left insisted on calling their project Practical Transhumanism because it provides an alternative developmental trajectory and an off-ramp, an escape hatch for those who get into something like a Musk or a Bostrom-led transhumanism. And it's a thorn for those who would appropriate punk just as they appropriate cyborg. I just published a model of punks and profiteers to help track these contestations, the posturing, the economic navigation of these technologists and the techno future overlays under which they operate. Punk is dynamic, punk is evasive, punk is always moving, always trying to stay just ahead of the profiteers who will catch and commodify everything, neutralize the revolutionary potential in everything and clothe their work in the language of resistance or survival in the case of Bostrom's long-termism. I want to warn you that the next slide contains images of blood and surgery, so I want to give you time to look away if that's what you need to do to take care of yourself, and I'll let you know when the slide changes again. So here's an image of a grinder preparing to implant a, um, a server into their leg, which will turn them into a mobile hotspot uh, wireless hard drive uh, called the peg leg device. It works. I've seen it. I've used it. It hosted a, an anonymous encrypted chat forum for all of us at the conference in their leg. Guided by Dante's imagery of flaying and metamorphosis, peeling their flesh, I perceived in Grinders a version, a strata of transhumanism that the literature just hasn't encompassed yet. These practitioners, these body artists who experiment on themselves, present a vision of human flourishing that's radically different from those who dream of engineered immortality. As Left said, I'm going to die a gritty, nasty, neat human. Practical needs and practical risks are central to their work. Like myself and many of us here at this conference, many grinders are disabled or rely on medication or on prosthetics or medical devices. They take risks and they want to make a future, not wait for an all-powerful AI god to create one for them. The image containing blood and surgery is now gone. As Left puts it, for those waiting for St. Elon, as Sarah put it the other day, to save them, as Left puts it, for those waiting for St. Elon to save them, quote, they're sitting on their asses waiting for a corporation to develop this shit. These people are saying they don't want to go through the pain of grinding. I want a fucking corporation to own the bits that will be in my body. That whole corporate-owned vision of the future is something I see as an absolute fucking technological nightmare. I want technology developed by the people, for the people, with the people. And then Left said, I know you're trying to record and I just dropped a million F-bombs, I'm so sorry. 
We need a history of transhumanism that is inclusive of punk as a key developmental trajectory. As Left and the Grinders and my colleagues on this panel have all helped to argue, the grassroots of transhumanism is in the heritage of DIY movements, maker movements, and especially, especially in the lives, in the work, and the communities of disabled and queer and marginalized folks who use their technical ingenuity to preserve and protect their lives and the lives in their community and to express their creative power to express that from where they are, which is inside of interlocking systems that deny them resources and deny them dignity. In their criticisms of coercive gender norms, fuck gender, says left, they have roots in anti-assimilation, queer punk like the Lavender Panthers. Grassroots transhumanists teaching their communities how to synthesize birth control at home draw inspiration from mid-century reproductive rights movements that risked arrest and punishment for challenging state control over people's bodies. Grassroots advocates hacking insulin pumps and continuous blood glucose monitors work toward an artificial pancreas that will sustain and preserve their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Grassroots hackers are part of the larger story of disabled communities needing to modify and create technologies to keep living and being part of this world. The grassroots lift each other up in a world organized to keep them down, even refusing to admit them to history. In what left calls scrap heap transhumanism, the grassroots strives to materialize an anti-oppressive future, making ladders and bridges of their own flesh in a manner that echoes Dante's transformation. Come to the junkyard, left urges. There in its rubble, you'll find the heirs of poets and of gods. I really appreciate your attention. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. So we have about 22 minutes for questions. Does anyone have a live mic in the audience? Or do we need to get that from the engineering table? All right, the mic's on its way. And we can be real casual about this. Just if you want to ask us anything, if you've got any comments or questions, we'll have a, we'll have a chat. Check, check. Yeah, that one's good. All right, let's try that. Works fine. So thank you. Um, this is this panel has an interesting coherence, and and uh, I appreciate the fact, Alicia, that you uh, read carefully some of my work. I uh, I would like to uh, respond to all of you kind of uh, to, it, to present a question to each one of you. Point number one, it's very hard to generalize about transhumanism because there's so many different strands of it. And whenever you say something critically, as I've done for the last 15 years, um, the person says, well, it doesn't describe me. So whatever you say is, is maybe right for somebody else, but not to me. So they, it, I call it like being a moving target. It's very hard to pin them down. So that's kind of point number one that we should all uh, keep in mind. Point number two, I do believe that there is a generational issue at stake here. The people that uh, I know, that I write about, that uh, I think are the kind of the movers of it, are about, I would say, 20 to 30 years older than the three of you. So, so uh, the conversation has changed over time. So I'm, uh, Jacob, to, to start with you, I think it's right, your point of uh, let's rewrite the story and let's actually create a, 
uh, a good history. There is no good history. There is no good ethnography of transhumanism. What I've done is really very introductory and not really good sociological work. So I think you're absolutely right that this is the time to, re to rewrite it. Uh, but also keep in mind that stuff that 30 years ago didn't exist, exists now. So biohacking didn't really exist 30 years ago or, or earlier. It's, it has become much more prevalent. So we need to keep that in mind. To Alicia's point about um, my use of the word idolatry, Fair enough, I have to say, your critique that if we are going to go by biblical position, these people have to be. But nobody's talking about idolatry today in, the, in a kind of a literalist position that you suggest. So uh, you can still critique a lot of things in our society are idolatrous. The use of money, for example. Clearly, nobody's going to talk about capitalism and, and, and capital punishment, right? So I think that that's, it, it, it's, a, it's a good argument maybe, but also limited argument. But I agree with you that um, more work needs to be done from what I've done. I just started the, the, to kind of to really deal with the problem, let's move forward. As to, for your uh, point, Jeremy, I'm, I'm not totally clear what you mean that when you define yourself as a transhumanist. I understand what you say, death positive. Death positive is also kind of a too vague a term. You can interpret it in a variety of ways. If I have cancer uh, and I decide that I'm going to accept my death, is that death positive? That's acceptance of reality. Yeah, I'm going to die because of cancer or because of whatever, a heart attack that would come if you have a high blood pressure or whatever. So I'm not sure that I understand exactly what death positivity uh, consists of. So those are the three questions to all of you. Thank you so much for engaging extensively with each of our presentations. We really appreciate your support and your engagement today. It's wonderful to have you here. I mean, it's, it's, I just have to say again, like it's really exciting. We've been reading you for years and it's just wonderful to, to be able to engage with you like this. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you um, for the opportunity to talk a little bit about how I understand um, my work connecting with the history um, of transhumanism. What I want to do with this new story or this retelling is to bring in um, the predecessors of the movement, like the punk scene, community medicine, um, I mentioned mid-century um, women's rights and reproductive rights movements like the Jane Network. I want to bring these in, um, anarchist medicine, um, the text like, for example, Where There Is No Doctor, um, and other movements, text publications, and activists who've aimed at empowering people at the community level to have access to life-saving technologies along with the social critiques that they offer as part of this trajectory that a, um, an anti-oppressive transhumanism emerges from. I also want to say thank you again. I was kind of nervous coming to critique you like this. I was very nervous coming to critique you like this in front of a crowd. Um, I think there's a lot more to what I've started. Um, this is a small portion of my thesis that will be out, hopefully, you know, submitted and published in, in a couple months, and I'll be able to address some of that also. Um, I think in terms of idolatry, like you said, there, there's a lot to unpack, especially in, in our society where so many things get elevated um, in daily use that can be interpreted, interpreted as a ritual, prayer ritual, worship ritual. Um, I think there's a lot more to the conversation to be had. Um, and I think, kind of in line with what you were saying, this next generation of transhumanists might not be so interested in seeing what they're doing as religious practice, but I think as we continue this research into the community, we'll have more definitive answers in the years to come. To yeah, please. That, like, I think that one of the things that's coming out in your work is that you're disinterested in the kind of elite transhumanists like Bostrom and Musk who are pushing for these artificial intelligence gods and these forms of technologically facilitated apotheosis um, or transcendence. I'm, uh, is, is this thing on? Hello. I'm going to be lazy and not get up. Um, so yeah, th thank you. Uh, 
uh, Natasha Vitamore always reminds me that, you know, uh, people in the transhumanist movement stand on the shoulder of giants, and I think we, we do as well. Uh, I'm very grateful that, that you're here. Um, so you're right. You can be, uh, you can accept death. You can accept the reality of death. You know, if you are a terminal patient, you can come to, you know, come to, um, to some form of acceptance. The way that I see death positivity Um, so the, the, the difference with death positivity um, is that it is a lifestyle. Like everything in capitalist society is a lifestyle. There is a movement that has, you know, its founders, its leaders, it has conferences, it has uh, merchandise that you can buy, um, it has an ethos and a worldview attached to it that goes beyond just death acceptance which is an element of this death positive movement and this self-identification that makes me a little uncomfortable in the same way that it does with transhumanism. One can, you know, hold the ideals of transhumanism, the, the hope for a better future through technology or technological means, um, and not necessarily self-identify as a transhumanist, because to do so, I think, is to attach oneself to a larger movement, to a lifestyle, to all of the trappings that come with that. Um, so all to say that yes, death positivity is its own kind of separate movement that has death acceptance as one of its primary goals, but has um, that there's a lot more to it than than just that. You know, there is a lot of um, advocacy and politics and politics of care associated with it. Um, and so I don't necessarily, uh, like I said, identify as a transhumanist, although you know, through my ethnographic work, through the work that we do, through the friends that I have made in my time as a, you know, a time doing field work, um, I, I've come to see some of the positive possibilities that exist in, in that world and in the discourse that occurs there, even though I am not necessarily um, in favor of all of the positions or the Nick Bostroms of, of the world. Um, yeah, I hope that answers or clarifies a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for a few more questions. I have a question for Sade. Um, thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. So, if, if it's if you're if you've already clarified these things and I just missed it, then I apologize. But for me, it stands as an open inquiry. You had mentioned a um, you'd given a quote by Ed Purdue. Um, if I'm pronouncing that right, talking one thing that stood out to me in that I'll mention first is the idea of. of producing permanent bliss states without side effects. Um, that stood out to me as uh, reminiscent of Soma and Brave New World and maybe a comment, maybe a question there, um, which is obviously a dystopia, technological dystopia. Um, and then I guess my question, then you showed kind of two responses following that on the next slide related to um, the idea of death as void and, and how we're relating to that or non-void. And I, I guess I'm curious how that connects to I would just like a little more clarity on how that connects to that prior slide and that quote in relation to um, uh, like a more technical oriented uh, appropriation of uh, psychedelics. And then just really lastly, what's the larger connection between transhumanist movements and psychedelic usage? Like, I think I understand your basic position, which is cognitive, you know, cognitive freedom prior to or adjacent to body freedom, but like within actual transhumanist discourse, is there some strong connection between psychedelic movements and usages and um, transhumanism? That's all. Thank you. Oh my gosh, thank you. Um, and with whom am I speaking? Oh, am I, am I audible? Now? I'm not hearing anything. They're, they're working on your audio. Okay, thanks. Can, can you try speaking? Testing. Yeah, you're good. Good? Okay, all right. Um, okay. Um, 
am I not? Yes, you're good. You're good at the moment. Okay. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering who you are. I can't see you. Oh, I see. Sorry. My name is Chris uh, Dunn and I am a, um, I have a background in philosophy, environmental studies and some other subjects. Oh, pleased to meet you, Chris. Um, I will, so I'll, um, I'll answer the second part first because it's fresher now. Yeah, what are the overlaps? Well, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about doing as I'm fleshing out this project, um, and I, I, I've been trying to decide what form it's going to take. So is it, is it going to be long form? Is it going to be a book? Is it going to be a series of articles? What, what am I going to do? Um, what's the way to get it out there? And, and the form of it is going to be related to how many different things I, I go into. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's going to be a book. And I think one of the things that I'd like to do is explore, do some digital ethnography, exploring, um, there are some subreddits that, that are specifically about like biohacking and psychedelics. And so, um, that's a way to get at, uh, say a population of people who are explicitly identified with, for instance, biohacking and psychedelics. Um, and then, uh, but, but beyond that so far, um, it's what I'm seeing are mentions like in that article, the excerpt of which I shared with you, that is that are connecting psychedelic aspirations with the aspirations of the like the, the great guys of transhumanism. And then um, I've noticed that there's also like a great guys phenomenon on the other side. So I was listening to um, uh, an interview bef between uh, a friend and colleague of mine and, and his mentor, Robin Carhart Harris, who is one of the major psychedelic researchers um, right now. He's at Imperial and also uh, UCSF, I, I think. Yeah. Um, and and he was talking about having been invited to to speak at a biohacking conference and um and then i so i, I went to i thought oh yeah that, that that makes sense like i i see in this space so so much overlap at least if not in in name necessarily and i'll be paying more attention to that but i haven't um I haven't cared too much so far, uh, but in, in, in purpose and in behaviors. So um, a lot of the, the psychedelic, the way that, that psychedelics are coming to mass market and the way that they're, the way that they're being mainstreamed right now is by coming to mass market. And they are, it's all sort of um, primarily dignified by the language of medicine and being functional for health and then secondarily dignified by and it's very old it's also religious in some fundamental sense and with the the, the health umbrella we see everything from the kind of flagship clinical trials like psilocybin and depression at hopkins to nootropic stuff and i think that's where i see a lot of familiarities a lot of similarities um with at, at the conferences that I go to for my psychedelic field work and the conferences that um, Jeremy and Jacob go to where there's a lot of expensive pills <laughs> for making you smarter, for making you healthier, for um, uh, all kinds of things. So a lot of uh, neotropic type, type work. And then, um, and then also a, a distinctly sort of spiritual consciousness hacking the idea of of that, that if we have a sort of radio mind, um, we can use psychedelics to tune that antenna to be able to actually uh, pick up on other dimensions of existence to make entity contact to 
actually learn something ontological. So yeah, so those are some overlaps, both explicit and implicit, a range of overlaps that I see between the psychedelics world and the biohacking and transhumanist um, parts of the Venn diagram of life. And then can, if, if we have time, um, and if you'd still like me to, can you um, just share your, your first question again about uh, wanting me to make the, the links between those two slides? Well, well, as we only have a couple minutes, I'm happy to um, defer that, but maybe I can reach out to you or something. Yeah, for sure, I'd love that. Yeah, thanks. Well, in that case, I, I was just noticed that that uh, quote was a, a, a pretty striking ref, uh, allusion to Soma in Brave New World. That was kind of my first point, which was not really a question. It was just a, an observation, and so you don't really need to reply. But, um, but on the note of the connection between transhumanism and, and psychedelics, um, <clears throat> I mean, one of the key research areas and applications of psychedelics that's emerging is... is uh, dealing with fatal illnesses and, and coming to terms with one's death. So it's a really interesting contrary prospect to sort of associate emerging psychedelics as like maybe a technical medicinal approach that somehow relates to transhumanism while at the same time, one of the main approaches, perhaps the main approach is dealing with death. So maybe there's something interesting there. Anyway, that's all I have. Thank, thank you all so much. Uh, we're gonna wrap up here. I really appreciate your time and attention. This was a wonderful experience. And thank you so much, Sade, for beaming in. Thanks for making that work, Jacob. I appreciate it and for the whole panel.